Hello, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for arriving today. Um, my name is Ange Loft, and I am one of the Advisory and Oversight Council for the Toronto Biennial of Art. I also help to contribute to this um, Indigenous Context Brief, which is part of their curatorial um, approach to creating this activity together. So I'm going to give you a bit of an alternative opening statement to begin us today. Um, I had the opportunity to work with the curatorial team for a moment to craft a um, a nice way to think about this understanding of acknowledgement. So we know about how this happens in Toronto. We know it's pretty basic. So this is another mode of going about that information. All right, so in 1793, the town of York was like very small. There were only about 12 houses that were completely finished at that time. And it was really pretty common knowledge that Treaty 13 was invalid. The exact limits were unknown. Nothing was done about this for about 10 years to deal with this issue. So the building continued in Toronto. Consider the effects of one thing leaving causing another effect. Lake Ontario is named after the Wendat Ontario, meaning Great Lake, or the Mohawk Skanaderio, meaning beautiful water. And by the, around the year 500, these Iroquoian type speaking people, they were corn growers. They inhabited the north side of the lake. Consider the foundations of buildings, not as architecture, but as community. This cosmopolitan city, when the Wendat lived here, they did not live alone. There were other nations who shared space with them. You will now include the Patoon, the Neutral, the Wenro, the Erie. Space between the pre-existing marks on the land, energy lines between things. So we, here in the Metro Convention Center, are in the quadrant of the Governor's House, the official residence of the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario. Quite a long time ago, this whole area was known as the Four Nations, Legislation, Education, Damnation, and Salvation. We're talking about Upper Canada College, the most popular tavern in town, and St. Andrew's Church. All righty. Consider the maze of nations building upon the foundations of previous nations, standing somewhere, moving, progress. Consider the maze of nations building the foundations John Graves Simcoe has done a great deal for this province. He has changed the name of every place in it. King Street, Princess Street, Duke Street, Duchess Street, Palace Street, leading to Parliament Street. Young Street was named after Sir George Young, Secretary of War from 1782, to ensure we take care of each other. The strength of connections, the consistency of our universe. The town of York lived in fear of an indigenous uprising. The concern was that the Mississaugas would turn against them, against the British settlers, for the multitude of local issues. I'll always have good intentions to act, to ensure we act with our truths. South and east of the lake were the homelands of the Seneca, the Cayuga, the Onondaga, the Oneida, and the Mohawk, the founding nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. The Anishinaabeg, they came all the way from farther north and west, but before that, they came from the east. Consider our surroundings in everything we do. We are at the base of Russell Creek. You could have taken a boat from right here up to Parliament and Bloor area. You would have passed by the AGO. You would have passed through Kensington Market, right up there. Hundreds of fishing and hunting camps would dot along that riverbank. Tensions rose with the ongoing disturbance of the Mississauga lands. Grave robbing, overfishing, the halt of gift-giving practices. Overlapping communities, a piece of the whole. With the 1796 murder of Chief Wabakini, the Mississaugas considered attacking York and all of the surrounding farms. The British fear of this attack is what led Fort York to be granted official army status. Before that, it was a garrison, thus Garrison Creek, now buried. The uprising never occurred. Purpose, pointing to something. Our creek, where we rest, Russell Creek, was the first place the early settlers managed to maintain successful farms in Toronto, all along the banks of that river. I'll always connect completely 
and actively to ensure we recenter our relationship to land as its own entity. Father, your children who now petition you are a remnant of the great nations who owned and inhabited the country in which you now live and make laws. The ground on which you and your children stand covers the bones of our fathers for many generations, the existing and in place. The government house was demolished to put in this railway in 1912. A new government house was never built. The Mississaugas didn't get to stay in Toronto. We know that. They now live on a portion of land just outside of Brantford. But you are here. I come as a visitor, and I want to do things in a good way. I'm going to tell you a little story now that goes back a little bit further, way, 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 way back in a time before we even had days and hours, before we understood how things worked even. When humans were so, so tiny and little that people would meet with them, they would meet with all of the other animals in the area. <laughs> all of the other animals, according to a Seneca chief named Corn Planter. So Corn Planter is a chief that's from uh, not too far away from here, but one of those nations I told you about were the Seneca folks. This is a legend that I retrieved quite a long time ago. And it is about a time and place where the animals still had the opportunity and the humans had still had the opportunity to speak with each other. In a very brief fashion, I'll tell you this story. Okay, so what happened is the animals, the humans, they would have these grand councils the animals decided to teach the humans so many different things. So the beaver would teach the humans how to create things out of wood, make dams, fishing weirs, that kind of stuff. The bear would go ahead and teach the humans how to like track things and go along paths. The wolf would also be there to teach the humans how to defend their territory. The raccoon and fox, they would go ahead and teach the human how to do things like climb trees and how to you know, be a little sneaky and get things from each other. So the wildcats also would teach the humans to do things like pounce, jump upon stuff, hide themselves, conceal themselves, be decent hunters. So in a very, very, very quick fashion, the humans picked up all of these skills. Very, very, very quickly, they became really good at them. And soon after, the animals decided this has to stop. We have to have a night council. So while the humans were asleep, the animals met together to discuss what do we do about these damn little squishy beings that are stealing all of our things. Um, they noticed that the humans started kind of taking too much fish from where the beavers told them to fish. The humans started kind of talking about you know, I'll let you come to hang over at my house and maybe you can come and lay on this nice bearskin rug. I know where to get some bears. So the humans were kind of starting to move in on the animals' territory, the bears and the wolves. They freaked right out and they took their cubs off into the mountains. The fox and the raccoons, they noticed that the humans were climbing way too high in the trees. They were starting to steal things from them. They were starting to go places they weren't supposed to go. And the wild cat then said, we need to do something about this. What shall we do? We will, the beaver said, take apart their houses. We taught them how to do it. Might as well take them apart. Let them freeze. The foxes said, let's steal all their food. We're going to take everything from them. They don't need it. They can figure it out. If they want to steal it, they'll steal it back from us. The wolf said, we're just going to kill them. I don't care. Let's just kill all the humans. The bear said, no, 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 wait, we have to at least give them a fair chance, so at least we'll wage a decent hand, you know, a war, like a real good war between the humans and the animals. And the wild cat agreed, yes, let's do it, kill them all. That dog, though, there was a dog in the group, and the dog stood up for all of the humans and said, hey, 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 those humans, they treat me pretty nice. They treat me pretty well. They give me food scraps. They let me hang out in the rooms with them. They let me go to hang out. They pet me. They're nice to me. They sing songs to me. We play together. Don't kill them. And of course, the dog was told effectively, you are um, being, you know, you're like too much on the side of the humans. You, could, you, know, you just want to lay in their laps and chill out there. You don't want to fight them. That's not a problem. Um, so what ends up happening is that the animals all go off to attack the humans. Everything's going to happen. Everyone agrees they're all going to go and attack the humans. The humans run away. 
because the dog goes and warns them and tells them what's going to happen. The humans take off, they hide for a little while, and then the animals decide amongst themselves, we're not dealing with these people anymore, we're changing our language entirely. Another version of the story has the creator coming down and saying, no more language for any of you. You will no longer understand each other. You can no longer teach each other anything. You are going to have to deal with just trying to imagine what you all have to say to each other. And the one who got kicked out of this whole deal was the dog. Thus, that's the only reason why we have a good relationship with the dog. And that's the reason why the animals no longer speak to the humans. In a nice little tidy package, let's tie this all together into the idea of interconnection and before all else. Thank you, Candace. Please join us. Thanks, Ange. So as you've already heard, we are joined today in various forms by Ange Loft, Louis Jacob, and Cyrus Marcus Ware. In between hearing from these artists, uh, my co-curator Tyrone and I are going to be narrating a kind of journey along the waterfront. The waterfront is the site of the forthcoming Toronto Biennial of Art that will open in 20, September of 2019, and we hope you'll all join us there. Many of the venues that we're working with have never been host to art before, and they stretch from the edges of the Portlands to Mississauga. And this region roughly mirrors the boundaries of Treaty 13, also known as the Toronto Purchase, which, if you look into the history, was really not a purchase from the Mississaugas of New Credit, but more like a land grab. These over 250,000 acres were exchanged in 1787 for 2,000 gun flints, 24 brass kettles, 120 mirrors, 24 laced hats, a bale of flowered flannel, and 96 gallons of rum, along with a small amount of money. So the Portlands is now a site of waning industry. Concrete barges are docked at the shore. Nondescript low-rise brick and concrete buildings line the road fronts, while conjoined silos, tens of stories high, sit like gatekeepers to the area. And these are silent sentinels to an area that is now undergoing rapid change. Yet, like all the areas along the waterfront, there's also small spaces of solitude, places where the shoreline retains something of its original character or its natural state. There are stretches of gray sand, and these provide vantage points out to Lake Ontario, its name itself a transliteration from the Wendat, or Haudenosaunee. It's also a place to consider what takes place beneath the surface of the water. For artist and researcher Susan Shipley, water and other items hold evidentiary information. She calls this material witnessing. For Shipley, who is one of the co-founders of forensic architecture, the material witness is indeed an entity whose physical properties or technical configuration records evidence of passing events to which it can bear witness. One of these that she has tracked include filmic emulsion, such as that resulting from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, a crude oil chimera, in her words, a natural disaster that gripped the world as the spill was broadcast in real time to millions of viewers. Recently, she's turned her interest to another witness, to ICE. The Canadian Ice Corps Archive, a completely unique library that documents thousands of years of environmental change, is housed at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. And earlier this year, in 2018, the climate control systems there malfunctioned, and conditions inside the vault went from minus 37 to 40 degrees above zero. And with this single technological glitch, an estimated 22,000 years of climate history that was previously frozen in time melted. 
As you move from the Portlands farther west and a little inland, a history of the place is quite literally built into the mortar of the buildings. As Angeloff relayed to us in her study, in 1797, there was there a traditional Mississauga burial ground that was disturbed on the corner of Bay and Bloor. The Mississaugas took it upon themselves. They realized that they needed to do something, and so they moved the bones of their ancestors to new locations, and they had moved a lot of them by 1813. But then soon new buildings went up over the area, and there are accounts that additional bones were taken away with the sand and then made into mortar. As we move west from the Portlands to the Toronto Islands, there's another story of presence, this one quite inscribed into the land. In 1908, when city's workers were digging a tunnel to Toronto Island, they came across a series of footprints. These are footprints in what was the blue clay, imprints left by a group of, they estimated, around 100 people who were walking away from the water. And a man named W.H. Cross made a drawing of the footprints before they covered them entirely. But a recent visit to the Toronto Islands has revealed that footprints have returned. They're stenciled there, intricately painted onto the concrete and wooden wa walkways of Ward Island, and these are of moccasins that mark the presence as well as the absence of Mississauga people who, like the Wendat before, made and make use of the island as a place to hold ceremony, to fish, to gather, to build community. Some years ago, Shazad Dawood began writing an essay about the failures of democracy. One of these failures from his perspective was, is the ability to produce empathy. Empathy for those who conventional citizenship fails to those who fall between the cracks, human and animal, and also beings that live in the water. And this led him to consider the relationships between marine welfare, migration, and mental health. And these writings grew and grew, eventually leading themselves to something that he calls now the Leviathan series, taking the form of scripts for a proposed 10 films, four of which exist at present, and a fifth is on the way. His Leviathan is set in the future at a time when the only inhabitants are those who survived a cataclysmic solar event. The episodes track characters as they drift across different countries, from Europe to Asia to North Africa and the Americas. In the words of Ben, who's known as the Traveler from episode five, he goes by his first name only, he says, like your man Hobbes, the beast Leviathan is dead and you are free to choose your own destiny wherever you choose to make it. There are no borders anymore, just a lack of vision. In what is now Toronto, when the dish with one spoon wampum was first created, it excluded Europeans from participating. From the perspective of those who were in charge of making this agreement, a treaty writ with the bowl, with the symbol of a bowl, with the del delicacy of beaver tail soup, in which everyone could share. At the time, there was a general consensus that Europeans' relatively, relative immaturity was noted in the sentiment that they were not yet prepared to take care of the land and the water and the sky and the reverse. This mutual respect for all living things, water included, so that resources can be both cared for as well as shared was at its heart. This wampum is circulating again, perhaps as a means to remember these old agreements that if abided by everyone, now living here will inscribe a different future. The new mineral collective is based in Tromsø, Norway, in the circumpolar north. And they look deeply at the effects, both aesthetic and otherwise, of human interaction on the Earth's surface. Mining, for them, produces what they call the perforated landscape. Through this, they consider alternative forces, including desire, what might be called body mining and counter prospecting. Their newsprint publication, Roboshi, chronicles a journey that they took to Russia's Kohler Superdeep Borehole, created concurrent with the space race, which drilled what is still 
the deepest hole in the surface of the earth. And they ask what might be a feminist geophilosophy of the land. How does this philosophy then translate to the water? Just west of the Toronto Islands are buildings that still host segments of Canada's military. And on Thursdays, the Fort York Armory, a rather nondescript brick building with a cavernous center, holds technical training for three regiments. These elaborate choreographies take place on the, on the floor of a space that feels like a mid-century airplane hangar. And this regiment is the same that fought in the Battle of Batoche, the decisive fight that ended Métis resistance and the provisional government that they had formed in the ultimate surrender of Louis Riel. The artist Althea Thalberger has worked with, with the military before. Canada still maintains a program that embeds artists in the military. Initially, and during the First World War, these artists were more straightforward documentarians. They were drawing, painting, and later taking photographs of missions for those to witness back home. In 2005, she worked in San Diego and Tijuana with the families of deployed spouses to form a choir. And they also were the ones who wrote songs. And five years later, she produced a massive photographic mural at the entrance to the library at the University of British Columbia that resulted in protests and open dialogues and the general sentiment that violence had no place at the entrance of a library or implied violence. In the image, eight Canadian soldiers are reenacting a military exercise in what is a simulation of an Afghan village. They pose with their guns around a car that is riddled with bullet holes. This was the aftermath of a training exercise that featured a suicide bomber. Her subjects represented themselves in the manner in which they chose. The artist prefers to be referred to as a producer rather than a director. And the remains of the military industrial complex along Toronto's waterfront is another site for potential engagement for Thauberger with self-defined communities considering the implications of representation with staging and with identity. Louis Jacob has had a long-standing interest in how the city of Toronto narrates itself, how its future is envisioned at different moments in time by different groups of people, be they engineers, social or religious groups, city planners, or members of the culture count counterculture movement he has an ever-growing archive of these materials, some of which were temporarily housed in our office, which is amazing to be surrounded by all of this, and some of the publications that are normally cast off after the use value has expired, say, census studies from the 1950s, proposals for the waterfront that were scrapped from the 1980s, or early renderings for iconic buildings like the CN Tower are all captured in his archive. What captured me, captivated me as I looked at these pamphlets these spiral bound studies and catalogs is how many different visions of the future of a city existed at any given time and that this future can only be imagined out of the conditions and ideologies of the present. So Louis, please welcome, join us. Thanks, Candice. Thanks, everyone, for coming. I was holding back tears as I sat to write this story two days ago. I don't know why I was feeling so emotional. All I know was that I was physically exhausted. Four days from today, on November 1st, I will face a 25% increase in the rent of my studio. And this follows a previous 25% rent increase last year. Being forced to organize a move of my studio contents in the midst of regular commitments and responsibilities, struggling to maintain a space in which to work is a strain on my body and psyche. I am reminded of the author Dionne Brand and her 1983 book of poems titled Winter Epigrams, where she wrote, the superintendent dug up the plants again each June, she plants them. Each September, she digs them up, just as they are blooming. 
this business of dying so often and so soon is getting to me. Yesterday, I packed a series of photos I made when I was 28 years old. They are titled, Evicted Studios at Nine Hannah Avenue, November 1999. Here are some installation shots of the time I showed these photos a decade after they were made at the Darling Foundry in Montreal. And here's a close-up of one of the photographs. Here are the photographs packed in a crate that I moved to a storage facility in Etobicoke yesterday. Today we speak of Toronto's cultural diversity. Half of this city's population was born outside of Canada. This is a city largely made by people who have packed and moved. My mom, dad, three brothers, and me are counted among such people. In March last year, curator Adam Lauder invited me to participate in an exhibition titled Futurisms that he was organizing at the Macintosh Gallery at Western University. He thought of me, he said, due to my engagement with London regionalism, an artistic discourse that is dear to my heart. As a response to Adam's invitation, I embarked on a project to visit every place I had lived in since my family moved from Lima to Toronto in 1981. Here is a photograph of my mom and me visiting our apartment building at 180 Markham Road in Scarborough, our first home in Toronto. Neither of us had been there in more than 35 years. She told me, full of emotion, that she used to watch my brothers and me from one of the balconies, one of these balconies in the photograph, as we walked each day to our first school in Canada. In grade five, I had to devise a way to let my teachers know I spoke no English. I decided during the recess break one day that I would yell out, careful, in Spanish, to the monitor teacher if the ball got close to her. So I waited and waited, hoping the ball was going to uh, go near her. And I yelled, cuidado, cuidado. This did the trick. And my brothers and I got pulled from our classes to spend the rest of the year with another boy from Chile and uh, a teacher that they especially dedicated uh, for us in the library. This impromptu ESL class was a successful exercise in improvisation on the school's part. I owe it my ability to speak to you today. At each place I visited for this project, I took a few color samples of the doorway, building walls, and nearby objects. Back in the studio, I selected 35 of these colors and approximated them as carefully as possible in oil paints. So here are the paints, and here are some of the panels that I applied them to in my studio. Here's the final work, titled Habitat, for example, on exhibition in London, Ontario. London is a special place to me because of Greg Curnow. This work is indebted to what I have learned from him and his connection to the city where he lived and worked. This is Curnow's work, titled 24 Hourly Notes. 14 to 15 December, 1966. He made it by stenciling one panel each hour, letter by letter, during a 24-hour cycle. I'll read the text in three of these panels. 5 p.m., late starting. The first A slipped. This white ink is slippery. G.H. 6 p.m., at 25 after 5, I switched to CKLW. It's dark out and the chimney has gradually become invisible. It's DA talking to Jamie on the phone, 
going over the difficulty of working in this fucking city. 7 p.m. The phone rings. I remember Owen drooling on the phone at 5, 3. I remember the first meeting that I had with Tyrone and Candice last summer. I showed them my monochrome panels for London and mentioned Greg Kerno. I also recall Candice saying, I love Kerno, and began to feel very connected to her. She told me that among indigenous communities, people find Kerno's work very useful. In particular, his last book titled Deeds, Nations, which was published posthumously by his friends in 1996. As Judith Roger notes, Deeds Nations is an alphabetical listing of over 1,000 First Nations individuals who lived in southwestern Ontario between 1750 and 1850. As archaeologist Neil Ferris explained, until Greg Kernow's monumental effort to track down, follow up, and piece together the personal biographies and family histories of the native people signing the southwestern Ontario land surrenders of the 18th and 19th centuries, little had been done to make sense of who most of these signatories were or their roles in local or regional communities. And Judith Rod Rogers continues, Kerno had extended his notion of regionalism from his backyard and the here and now to what had happened in his region for thousands of years. As he wrote, I have felt the power of many details adding up to an understanding of the ground I am standing on. It is an understanding that is new to me. Here is a piece of ground I photographed at St. Jamestown on July 2nd this past summer. And here's another photograph from last summer which I took at Regent's Park. Wanda Nanabush, curator of indigenous art at the AGO, organized an exhibition titled Toronto Tributes and Tributaries, 1971 to 1989, where she observed, this city tends to bury things, histories, neighborhoods, waterways. I understand Regent Park as a place that has been buried many times over. In the 1680s, the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy pushed back the Haudenosaunee from here to the south side of Lake Ontario. By the time the 20th century rolled around, Irish settlers established Cabbage Town right here in, in the place uh, depicted in the photograph, burying in some ways the indigenous presence there. In the 1940s, these Irish people were deemed a nuisance by city officials. Following modernist urban planning principles of urban renewal and slum clearance, their neighborhood was bulldozed to the ground to make way for Regent Park, which eventually became a home for working class immigrants of color. Then, in 2003, City Council decided this community had itself become a nuisance. Council approved the Regent Park Revitalization Plan as a public-private partnership between community, Toronto Community Housing and Daniels Corporation to develop existing social housing buildings into new mixed income buildings that include for-profit market units. Here on the left is Peter Dickinson's Mezzanette Towers, completed in 1958, and an award-winning part of Regent Park. Here it is, being demolished. These are people's homes. And here is another piece of ground I photographed at the Leslie Spit on July 17 last year. Leslie Spit is a geography entirely made of this city's demolished buildings. What I love about this is how somebody, a group of people, had rearranged this material of dispossession. They adopted this urban detritus of a, running, of a city running on a business of dying so often and so soon in order to construct for themselves a gathering spot at the water. 
This story is some of, some of the many details adding up to an understanding of the ground that I am standing on. And this is what I see. Thanks. My part of the story begins at Coronation Park on the waterfront. It's a journey and we're moving westward. The grass at Coronation Park is always bright and perfectly manicured. Next time you're there, take a closer look. The sports fields, trees, bushes, and flower beds are always trimmed and fertile. It's striking when you compare it to other parks and even seems a bit odd. That is, unless you know that Toronto Parks and Recreation have an operational base here, and the park is their backyard. It's their calling card, their pride and joy. Their base of operations is a modest building of brick and concrete, with a freestanding tower at one end and a two-story structure at the other. The architecture is nondescript, but what attracts the eye is a large frieze of abstract cherry-colored shapes that wrap themselves around the second story. As you approach, the shapes reveal themselves to be two-dimensional abstractions of Arctic animals, structures and landscapes, from whales and caribou to icebergs and skidoos. The figures stand out amidst the trees and the condos in the distance. They claim the skyline around us, like floating constellations. They're not of this place, these Arctic beasts and figures, and yet they are. These images and their stories are connected by land and water, by great distances. It just takes time and imagination to consider. And by these measures, they are certainly of this place, connected by ecological systems, as well as story, art, and commerce. It's no less distant and takes no less effort to imagine, to consider Coronation Park's connection to its name, the British Crown. The park was built in 1934 and christened in 1939 by King George VI, following his ascent to the throne. The great oak in the center of the park is supposed to be a stand-in for the king, and the maple trees that surround it are representations of the colonies, all subjects to the crown. I enjoy reflecting on this intervention and this idea that floating above it all, existing outside this rigid organization of power and control, this earthbound leviathan, is a constellation of ununiform figures in the sky that represent a different relationship to place, freer structures and organizational logics of ideas and people and land. PA System is a collective made up of artists Alexa Hatanaka and Patrick Thompson that creates collaborative and socially engaged projects in the high Arctic, including their ongoing project with Inuit youth in Kingate, Cape Dorset, Nunavut called Embassy of Imagination. Their workshops have been providing young artists with training and experience working with art forms that they're interested in but can't otherwise access. The young artists also get opportunities to travel and share their art within their community and across Canada. We leave the shade of Coronation Park and follow the path west, turning south. We make our way along a winding, man-made coastline. The grass falls away and we reach an iron gate. Passing through and on the other side, I look up and feel instantly miniaturized by the unexpected scale of the buildings and structures ahead of me. Five steel columns plunge into the lake and at their tops, suspended by cables and connected by two-story walkways, are five white diamond-shaped pods the size of cruise ships. Windows that stretch from floor to ceiling look out onto the world but there's nothing inside. These pods, these hovering masses of steel and aluminum are empty. You can't help but marvel at the craziness of it all. What am I looking at? What are my reference points? Are these trees standing in water or the International Space Station on stilts? They feel alien, but also strangely familiar, like kinetic buildings in a Ron Heron sketchbook or a fantastical city in the paintings of Jules Solar. Ontario Place is a site of what appears to be competing impulses. Designed by Ebb Zeidler and Michael Huff in 1972, one an architect of modernist visions that, in his own words, exploited technology to shape the society for tomorrow. 
and the other a landscape architect that pioneered environmental and ecological based design. Their approaches intersect but seem to pull in different directions. On the one side, there's a drive to reconnect people to the lake, people who were then and are still now physically and psychically separated by the freeway. And yet, despite the location and the waterborne attractions, the complex is ultimately a fortress, separated and above, and surrounded by a moat. It's optimistic and brutal at the same time. It yearns to connect, but remains aloof. Ontario Place was built at the height of nationalist fervor in Canada, following the success of Expo 67 and the Canadian Centennial. Cities across the country channeled their enthusiasm into ambitious urban projects intended to galvanize and transform their city. It was a hopeful period. Terraforming was a way to create new landscapes that could be open to everyone, using the latest engineering and technological know-how. Huff's work seems at odds with this effort. Indeed, his writings and environmental activism are instrumental in currently popular notions of naturalizing landscapes. From his work as the lead author of Bringing Back the Dawn, to the involvement in the master plan for the brickworks and from his teachings at U of T in York. But even in conservation, we can identify the terrifying realities of a desire to change the world around us and to claim it. It's difficult to discern what along the waterfront is natural and what is infilled, bordered, and manicured. How do you reconcile the invasive with the indigenous? And as you approach closer into and through the complex, you pass the dozens of other pavilions and silos, towers to nowhere, fake mountain passes, and dried up log rides, all of which has been for some time closed to the public, dormant, decrepit, and on the brink of ruin. Unintentionally, these buildings now represent a lost optimism, futurities that turned out to be dead ends. The international modernism of the past stemmed from a point of view that turned out to be myopic. It ignored so much about the realities of the era that continue to expand and terrorize our present and our future, from neoliberalism and globalization to total ecological destruction. Carolyn Monet uses cinema, sculpture, and installation to communicate complex ideas about indigenous identity and bicultural living through the examination of cultural histories. She often works with industrial materials, combining the vocabulary of popular and traditional visual cultures within the tropes of modernist abstraction to create unique hybrid forms that speaks to the intricate realities of indigenous peoples today. We still have a far distance to travel, so from here we jump on bikes and pick up the pace. Heading west, we want to make a few more stops along the way. On our bikes, we fly by the Canadian National Exhibition, Marilyn Bell Park, the Boulevard Club, Palais Royale, the Argonaut Rowing Club, and Sunnyside Beach. We make our way to the Humber River. Crossing its mouth, we look north and are transported back and forward through time. This place was once called Kobanachonok by the Anishinaabe, which means leave the canoes and go back. This place is a starting point of the Carrying Place Trail a major portage route that connected Lake Ontario to Lake Simcoe and from there to the other northern Great Lakes. In the 1600s, the trail ran northward along the eastern bank of the Humber and crisscrossed several times. It was an important route for the fur trade. Much of the ancient trail has been lost to modern development, but can still be traced along city streets, back alleys, and country paths. Looking upriver, we imagine works here and elsewhere that track the movement of goods and people along natural through lines, ideas that connect via the water to other worlds, other places, that reach up through the rivers and the buried waterways north into the landscape, under the city, expansive, rhizomatic, everywhere. These waterways were important as a meeting point and a means of transport and trade. It was here that relationships were formed and it is here that relationships can be renewed. Walks pervade our experience of the city in Toronto when talking about people's relationships to land, community, and each other. Journeys like our own are popular forms of learning by moving through landscape, an experience of and an acknowledgement of our being in the world. These are the ways that citizens have taken it upon themselves to narrate alternative histories, to make them personal, to share stories about the almost forgotten, reinscribing memories through a blend of physical experience and oral tradition that are in some ways more precarious and in other ways more resilient than monuments of stone and metal. 
Nelfus Ramirez Figueroa is an artist that explores the nexus of history and form through the lens of his own displacement during, the, during and following Guatemala's civil, Guatemala civil War of 1960 to 96. He reframes historical events and protagonists through the visual and performative languages of folklore, science fiction, and theater. And his work invites viewers into a world of myth and symbolism, rooted in the terrifying truths of our past. We keep on track and bike a fair distance to our final destination. We cross Etobicoke Creek and reach a heavily wooded area. And as we come up through the trails, we see a clearing of overgrown grass with a cement bunker on one side and more than a dozen freestanding walls on the other. The walls are arranged at various angles across the expanse. They appear sculptural, their hard edges and solid forms softened by time and blending into the overgrowth that surrounds them. We move past and further up the path and reach a squat building with a tall red brick smokestack. It looks familiar like other industrial buildings of the first half of the 20th century that can be found between here and the other areas of the waterfront. The small arms and section building is the last remaining building of what was once a large complex on the eastern border of Mississauga. The building sits on a parcel of land that was once the territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the traditional homeland of the Wendat, the Anishinaabe, and the Haudenosaunee nations. The site's military history goes back to 1910, when it was acquired and registered by the Department of National Defense and used for militia training during World War I. In the lead up to Canada's involvement in World War II, the factory complex was built to manufacture rifles and small arms for the Canadian, British, and Allied armies. At the height of its operations and with a workforce dominated by women, it produced thousands of rifles per day. The concrete bunker and wooden walls we saw earlier were used as a rifle range Originally, over 30 wooden baffles were built to block sounds and prevent stray bullets from leaving the range. Today, only 16 remain. Sites like the Small Arms and others that we've visited along the waterfront are part of colonial systems of social, political, and economic control. They are symbols of war and empire that undergird and frame the national consciousness to this day and are reinscribed in physical sites and in the ceremonies that surround them. In seeking alternative positions and counter-narratives, we find ourselves diving further and further back to periods of deeper time, places that you can only reach through projection of imagination and trust in the agency of all things. It's not insignificant that these stories are presented as something that is believed but not yet qualified as fact. Some histories are concrete and empirically measured, but these too can be challenged, whilst others remain fictions, rumors, and myths. This is something I struggle with and went back and forth on as we journeyed west across the waterfront, that by relying so much on orality, we risk the precarity and limits of our bodies. We are at the mercy of our being and of time. And yet through storytelling, we're also able to accept so much more ambiguity and complexity and to re respect our impermanence whilst recognizing the infinite in our relationships with others and the world that surrounds us. Irene Rungjang is known for deftly revising historical material, overlapping major and minor narratives across multiple times, places, and languages. He works with video and site-specific installations to explore everyday issues and experiences such as memory, living space, history of family, and individuals, and migration. We turn around and look back through the trees and across the lake. We see the city small amidst the landscape, the lake, on the other hand, is massive, stretching so far that the water line meets the sky, a veritable sea. One need only imagine what beasts lie underneath and what beings are looking back at us from other distant shores. These artists that we've introduced today guide us through their storytelling and myth-making. Their works complicate and challenge predominant narratives, offering alternative versions informed by different worldviews that guide us and perhaps even actively work towards a multiplicity of futures. Cyrus Marcus Ware is a visual artist, activist, curator, and educator. He works in painting, installation, and performance to explore social justice frameworks and black activist culture. His work often aims to challenge systemic oppression and explore the spaces between and around identity. Cyrus is our next storyteller, and he comes to us from a possible future. 
the Antarctic shoreline was the first to change. Ice sheets larger than entire cities had begun cleaving themselves off the glacier since the 1970s, but the melting increased as the decades wore on. It was as if the shoreline was being reborn, rocky outcroppings peeking out from underneath ice that had covered it for millennia. In late 2018, an ice sheet five times the size of Manhattan broke off of Antarctica's Pine Island Glacier. News of its breakage was minor, and its massive shape slipped silently into the water while sounding a resounding warning about global warming. By the time the damage had been done, sea levels rising and ocean temperatures increasing, news of the ice sheet seemed to reach too late to be impactful. This ice sheet was singled by many as the last evidence needed to prove that climate change was real and that we were in the dreaded depths of the Anthropocene. After the sheet broke off, predictably sea levels rose globally. It added to oceanic warming and helped move other sheets on the glacier. Eventually, ice sheets were breaking off the Antarctic glaciers daily, clogging up the bays like ice chunks being broken and jammed down the Assiniboine River in Winnipeg at the end of a long winter, cracking and breaking. At the first sign of rock appearing through the ice, the powerful men who made these kinds of decisions knew that it was time to put their long-awaited plans into action. Eleven people had been born at that point on Antarctic ice. One was born in the 70s, an accidental occurrence during a science expedition. But all of the rest were sent there to be born, to stake a future land claim through birthright. In the summer of 2030, with the world on fire with climate change, post-Trump wreckage, and the crushing sects of both conservatism and the Anthropocene, these babies, now grown, were called home. Most of them had never set foot on Antarctica's shores, being born in boats just safely inside its water, close enough to count as an Antarctic birth. Others were so young, their parents would have carried them more recently in folded arms and tight hugs away from Antarctica, their tiny feet never touching on the tundra. By 2030, the rocks were mostly bare, with dirty snow peaks on their tips, like on sidewalks at the end of a long city winter. There was plant life sprouting up all over the continent, Arctic moss, sea buckthorn, heather, Insects arrived on the continent for the first time in millennia, aside from the bird fleas that lived on the birds that nested there during Antarctica's coldest moments. The botanists said it was time. The entomologists said it was time. The plan had to begin. Even more pressing, small-scale Antarctic tourism had begun, with boatloads of drunk adventure tourists coming to the waters around Antarctica during its summer months. None of these tour ships were allowed to land, but it was only a matter of time before the adventure tour corporations began pushing for this too. And so the powerful men who make these kinds of decisions deployed their Antarctic citizens. New Zealand was the first to send its people. They set up their camp on the far east side of the continent in their neat little piece of Antarctica's pie. Canada was next sending me. The others followed in the coming weeks and months. Of all the countries, Canada was perhaps the least prepared for our efforts. Sure, we had the Arctic, and I had spent months training in the north to prepare myself for life in the far south. But we couldn't survey the Antarctic land often, and we had less intel on what was happening on the continent at any given time. In short, we were just too far away. As such, I left Canada with much mystery surrounding my trip. What would I find when I got down there? How much had the other countries set up? I would be very alone. I was on a solo trip, while other countries had two or three people working together to set up their colony. I was forced to attend classes on how to colonize. I was forced to do drills, practicing in the armory, racing back and forth across the rubber floor. I became what they wanted me to be, a change maker, a terraformer, a colonizer. When I got on the ship that was to take me to my new home, I was full of anxiety. Not because of the journey, but because I knew in my deepest heart that I could not carry out their goals. You see, they hadn't really kept tabs on me when I came to Canada to be raised by my family. They knew I was there and ready to be deployed when they needed me, needed me and so perhaps they didn't keep me on enough of a leash. 
I had become politicized through organizing to support the life of Mamiya Abu-Jamal in the late 90s in Toronto. I joined Friends of Move, and I had organized protests in front of the U.S. consulate. I'd begun prison abolition groups, political film festivals. I had campaigned. I had organized. By the time I was deployed to Antarctica, I had been an activist for too long to ever consider their goals as my goals. I wouldn't be their colonizer, but I still had to go through the motions. So, sitting on that boat, I was scared. Not because of the mission. I was scared because I was headed to Antarctica to start a revolution. Alone. Hello, everyone. I'm Patrizia Liberalato, one of the founders and the executive director of the Toronto Biennial of Art. I'm beyond delighted to see all of you here at this talk, learning and celebrating the progress and the future launch of a biennial for our city. Firstly, I'd love to thank um, our amazing participants today. What, what an event this was. Thank you. Thank you, Ange. Thank you, Louis. Thank you, Cyrus. And a huge thanks to our curators, Candace and Tyrone, for your incredibly thoughtful work in bringing this project to life. Thank you. And a big shout out to my team, the formidable Ilana Shamoon, Director of Programming, our newest superstar team members, Sabrina Marr, um, who is our development manager, and Myung Sung Kim, our new assistant curator of education and community. So this entire dream team shows up every day with their many hats on, ready to build this project for Toronto. Um, it's an incredible day every day. And a huge thanks to my fearless board members. There's some of you here. We're all doing this because of your support and efforts. I need to thank founding supporters today because many of you stepped up when this was all very conceptual at the very beginning. So thank you, City of Toronto, City of Mississauga, Government Ontario, the TD Ready Commitment, St. Joseph Communications, Dickinson Wright, CIBC, Castle Point Numa, Mencus Developments, The Gas Company Inc., Canadian Art, Onyx, The Gerald Schwartz and Heather Reisman Foundation, Yamana Gold, and Stratus Vineyards. Thank you. So I invite you all to uh, check out our new website that just launched. Please do visit, sign up, support. This is going to take everyone's you know, support. It's going to take the entire community. Um, and we will have a ton of fun along the way. We will also be at our booth at B15 after this talk. And you know, please do come by, see, learn more about our partners, um, ask questions learn more about our plans for education and for community programming, and also take in some views from the beautiful work that Louis Jacob um, did, or additional work that he did for our project. Thank you, Louis. So many thanks again, and enjoy the rest of your stay at Art Toronto. Thank you.